We ready? Okay. We've been <clears throat> we've been studying um, the prodigal son <laughs> at length, which has brought us to Cain and Abel, and um, we <clears throat> had just finished up. Um, one of the things was the first conversation God had with Cain uh, before um, Cain killed Abel. <clears throat> and then we talked about Abel's sacrificial death, and we saw that death as uh, we saw it uh, compared in Hebrews uh, 11, um, where it is a death whose blood yet speaketh. It is not a, a dead death. It is a living death, and that's what Jesus' death was. And we went into great detail about all of that. <clears throat> and, um, um, and we ended with... <clears throat> Um, I, I had this statement, why did God not stop this? You know, why did God allow what appeared to be a senseless murder and, um, and Abel who offered to God what he wanted, not the fruit of the earth that was cursed, but the lamb, or lambs, or, <clears throat> but he did it in, in knowledge, and we went through all the scriptures that showed that. And so we were asking the question, why? Why didn't God stop it? Or, uh, and I wrote this, and I had read it last time at the very end. No, God didn't stop it because it was not a murder but a sacrifice. The same with Jesus. Um, and the, I was think I was just, I meditate without knowing it a lot of times, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me, and I was thinking about eating the sacrifice, and the Holy Spirit corrected me, and he said, you're not eating the sacrifice. You're eating the sacrificial one. Because, the, you know, this, to eat the sacrifice is this the thing that died, and we eat this, and praise God, and all that. But when... Uh, and we went through this in Exodus where the firstborn were, they all were to eat the lamb, but they weren't just eating the sacrifice. And in that case, think of it, it really, I mean, wasn't a sacrifice in a certain sense, and yet it is always a sacrifice because all, you know, when Jesus said, I do always those things that please the Father, it is in that spirit, and that's what pleases the Father. Okay, so praise God. That, that focuses in on the, more the heart of the thing instead of just thinking in terms of Israel and they sacrifice and this sort of thing. I wrote, with Abel, we saw God's favor at the altar, and we were talking about <clears throat> not just finding grace, but <clears throat> there is a favor that happens at the altar. And, and, and of course, that requires, because it's not just the altar, because Cain also had an altar. It is the favor of offering up his firstborn son. <clears throat> and um, many people offer, but Abel not only gained acceptance through the lamb he offered, but he willingly gave himself also. God's altar favor is not only what bought the favor for Abel, but what caused his own death. Because he would enter into that. He would, he would not just give a sacrifice, he would be the sacrifice. And that's why his blood yet speaketh. <clears throat> All right, so now tonight we want to we wanna talk about the second conversation between God and Cain. Um, we went through the first one, we discussed the aspects of it, but this, this one has taken place after Cain kills Abel. So this is in Genesis chapter 4, 
and uh, verse 9, starting with verse 9, Genesis 4, 9, <clears throat> and we'll read 9 through 15, or actually, yeah, 9 through 15. Genesis 4, 9, and the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? Now, if you want to know why that thy brother is added, just read First John. <laughs> and you'll get it. <clears throat> and he said, I know not. Okay, well, now he's a liar too. <laughs> he's not just a murderer. He's a, and you know, I mean, I think that we do that because we think we can trick God. Like he's not going to get it. <clears throat> I'm really much more innocent than this appears. You know. Uh, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. And then here's the dead giveaway of what spirit he's in. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes. You are supposed to be. Not your brother's murderer, but your brother's keeper. Okay. Or not your sister's murderer, but your sister's keeper. Um, I, won't, I won't go into too much on that. And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me. So here's something of Abel crying unto God. and something of Cain not crying unto God. You have one that's dead and yet crying unto God. You have one that's alive and not crying unto God after doing something like that. The voice of thy brother crieth unto me from the ground, and now thou art cursed <clears throat> from the earth. Of course, that was, that was his method of offering that he thought he was going to find favor with God was he brought the fruit of the earth. And remember, the scripture didn't say he brought the first fruit, the fir which represents the firstborn son. He brought just the first fruit. And God said, you, you will be cursed from being able to even do this anymore. So I don't know if that's permanent, but Cain is cursed from being able. Um, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand, from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Um, verse 13, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. My punishment is greater than I can bear. I wrote, the murderer thinks it's too hard to face death himself, but not too hard to crucify others. All right, folks, forget the story. What about our story? What about the story we're writing every day? What about what we're putting down? What we are making our story? Um, do we... Uh, do we find it okay to crucify somebody for whatever reason, for whatever reason, even if justly they deserve it, therefore we're justified. But when it comes our turn, is it too hard for us? It's not, can't be too hard for Abel to be murdered. Because you remember, he said, everywhere I go, they're going to, Let's just read that so you can see that. Um, uh, verse 13 again. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And behold, thou hast driven, driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face 
shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. <clears throat> so the Lord's actually protecting Cain from being murdered. All right, so whose life are we supposed to be living by? Who's, whose life? I mean, really, what, in a real way, what pen are we using to write our life story? Are we, using, are we using our pen and our understanding and our preferences and our, uh, our um, uh, hurts that maybe happened years before this present thing happened, but this is reminding me even if I don't, in my mind remember and I'm lashing out I'm writing my own story and I'm calling that because because we think we're writing the story of the Lord we're living for God right we're living for God I mean we could be out there and having fun and wild parties and all this kind of stuff hmm I think I'll <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll drink to that <laughs> but just being a Christian doesn't do anything it's supposed to be Christ in you the hope of glory it's supposed to be his nature his approach um, and one day we will get to a certain thing that I can address along these lines that will clarify certain things because we, we see, we, here's us, this is us, and this is why our story is written the way it is. We don't like people to put us in a bad light. We don't like certain things to happen. We, you know, it's all that, that it's all us. Jesus had been forever with the Father. With perfect order, and he comes down here in this mass chaos. Have you ever been in a situation that seemed like mass chaos? I'm not talking about your home every day. <laughs> I'm glad I got one that understands. <laughs> Well, whatever it is, with all of ours cumulatively together, including the whole world, it's nothing of what Jesus experienced in our mass chaos of the way that we think and the way that we speak and the way that we reach our hand and the way that we, we, we uh, our attitudes, even when we don't say anything, you know, and you know, people people might. I'm sure people think that I'm this next part just comes because I was a hippie, you know, and so we don't say anything. Have you ever been around somebody who wasn't saying anything, but boy, could you pick up the vibes? Back to you again. I mean, no, not really. <laughs> I think we all have been that person. But it is also true that we, we allow that stench that to come out of us. We, we might even take credit by saying, boy, they should be thankful I didn't say anything. <laughs> you know, and I'm pretty sure we should be. But to the Lord, he goes by essence. We're looking on the outward appearance, but God sees the heart of the stench. You know what I mean? Well, okay, so life is short. Do you believe that? Well, it is. And when is the time to get after the Lord? At what juncture 
Will it be, and when I say get after the Lord, I don't mean start going to church more and praying more. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to get after the Lord. I mean, I am sick and tired of me. I want the Lord's nature. I want him. He must increase and I must decrease. But how many gatherings have we and every other church had that the emphasis was he must increase without any decrease on our part? Without any thought of it, you know? Well, my heart, I'm very open and I'm very tender, so I'm seeking him. And you know, well, what's in your closet? Shh. I'm seeking the Lord. Don't distract me. You know? <laughs> you know? It is just a fact. There has to come a time when we start pulling the junk out of there and going, you're going, you know, it's, it's, today is trash day. <laughs> today is trash day. And, and, and saying, Lord, I, I'm not just dealing with problems. I am replacing this mess with you. You know, I mean, you know, the thought is, and this is sort of, sort of commonly understood. I mean, if you cast out a demon, you say, Holy Spirit, fill that where that enemy was. You don't just cast it out. And Jesus says, because if you do, there's an empty place and he brings back seven worse than before. Well, we say, boy, I know that. I am smart when it comes to deliverance. But what about, what about trying to, you know, coming to a meeting or, or in your private time, trying to empty the trash out without filling it, but don't try to fill it without emptying it either. You know, Jesus, get in there with the garbage. Would you just sit on top of that, you know, that pile of, you know, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I know all these things because I am all these things. I mean, I have failed on more points than you could ever imagine. But the advantage of failing is that if your heart really wants the Lord, you go, okay, I'm not going to, you know. <clears throat> I remember years, years and years ago, the Lord spoke and he said that there are, there are people that preach a Christless cross and there are people that preach a crossless Christ. You know, they preach the cross without Christ. They preach Christ without the cross. And without the cross, you know, because we can say, I'm after you, Jesus, but without the cross that he's hanging on, there is no removal. That's right. You know, we can look up to him and go, oh, I want you. I did it done. He says, well, crawl up here on this cross with me because this is where I, I brought you 2,000 years ago. I took care of this. This is settled but it has to be settled in you. It has to be what your heart is. It was his heart, so he followed through and he went through all the pain, all the junk, all the stuff that was, was required to make a way. Now he's waiting on us and we go, well, I'm waiting on the Lord to move. If the Lord would just move, then I would be better. You know, and he's going, hey, I've already moved. Amen. You know, catch up to the times. That was 2,000 years ago that I did this, you know. You know. And, but find his heart in, in what he did when he did it 2,000 years ago. Find his heart in that. How about that? How about not just, uh, I'm in Christ. Uh, I'm dead with Christ. Uh, all the, all the, that it's just junk if you don't really understand the spirit that brought it all about. You know, what's the difference between Jesus on his cross and these guys? The two on either side. The difference is Jesus is a living sacrifice that is giving himself and was giving himself and will ever give himself. And one was a vile creature and the other one at least recognize he doesn't deserve this but he's doing this by free will 
because, you know, you didn't have a lot of people standing around going, this is wrong. He doesn't deserve this, except some guy on the cross <laughs> beside him. So Jesus said, well, your place then, just, just by recognizing that much, because you're talking not about yourself, your place then is with me. And everything will change. Everything will change. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Yes, Glory to God. <clears throat> so, um, the scripture says, um, Cain said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Thou hast driven me out. You did this. You drove me out. I think I would have been better. I would have, I would have recovered. <laughs> but you drove me out. And he says, um, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. Okay, I shall, I shall, what did, what's that wording? Uh, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the, if you do this, I'm going to be a fugitive and a va and vagabond in the earth. Um, the Lord's looking at him going, you know, you're a murderer. You murdered the one, my choice for firstborn. People put Jesus on the cross. You murdered my choice the one I showed what this, the favor from my heart, and I openly showed it into the earth, and you murdered my firstborn, my beloved son. And we'll see that as we go, not tonight, but we'll, we'll get into the, we'll see he became the beloved son, okay. Uh, and... And he's whining about, well, I, but I'm going to become a vagabond. You're a freaking murderer. But I don't want to be a vagabond. <laughs> I was okay with being a murderer. But I don't want to be a vagabond. Let's see. All right. Is it possible to justify daily or weekly acts of talking bad about somebody um, and being okay with that. But if God says, well, you know, you're going to be a vagabond, we go, well, what? I can't bear that. Oh, you can bear being a murderer. You can. Well, then you're going to be a vagabond. <laughs> you see how that works? So that's when I wrote, the murderer thinks it's too hard to face death himself, but not too hard to crucify others. All right, there's a lot more information in here, and we'll deal with that this later, this, these two verses here, three, actually several. <clears throat> um, I want to get into what is the sin uh, and the curse of Cain. I want to get into what is the, what is the thing that, people debate uh, was the real problem that caused Cain to kill Abel. Uh, and to do that, I want to read out of a New Testament book, probably one of your favorites, book of Jude. <laughs> hey, Jude. You can't say don't make it bad, because <laughs> he definitely does. <laughs> All right, Jude, no chapter, just 10 and 11. All right, Jude 10 and 11. <clears throat> but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. 
for they have gone the way of Cain. They have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. <clears throat> All right, so you got three of them. You got three inhabitants inside of you. You got more than that, but you got these fellas. You got Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Or you could just say there's this one in there, and that's you. Unless it's Christ. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll just read this. Here in Jude, we are made aware that there was a way in Cain that is not good. Based upon this verse, people try to identify the sin of Cain in order to avoid its pitfalls. Well, what? What was, where did he mess up that he went and killed his brother? Or they think that it's the fact that he killed his brother. <clears throat> they think that there was something that caused God to reject Cain's offering. But his sin was found in the fact that there was no lamb. I'm not talking about the lack of a lamb in his outward offering, but inside of the man. Clearly, based upon his actions subsequent to their offering, we can see that he was no firstborn to God. Um, <clears throat> the, the verse that we read out of Jude says that they speak evil of things they know not. Okay. If you were counseling Cain before he killed Abel, <laughs> um, the first thing wouldn't be to tell him, don't speak evil. It would be, there are things that you don't know except naturally as a brute beast. Meaning just as a human down here viewing things the way that anybody does. <clears throat> I don't know how many of the seed of Cain are going to receive that because all the examples from the prodigal son to the, the parable of the vineyard to Cain and Abel to uh, 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 Ishmael and Isaac to Esau and Jacob to Joseph and his brothers, <clears throat> everyone thought they understood and didn't understand God at all and didn't understand what God wanted and were just trying to get rid of the firstborn that they didn't think deserved it. I mean, Joseph was not the firstborn. He was the second. No, I'm sorry, third. No, fourth, fifth, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, thirteen. in the sense of their understanding. He's the young one, he's the <clears throat> why, you know. Believe it or not, we'll get to that. How old am I? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we will. <clears throat> it's all, I've got it already, I've been there. I've got a lot to share from all of these as we make our way straight, a straight line heading in that direction. <clears throat> um, so do not mistake what the true issues are with Cain. It is not simply found in him rising up and killing his brother. That is not the issues. Okay? That's not the issues. He rose up and he killed his brother. He shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> Oh, Lord, no, that is not the issue. That action was only the fruit of several things at work in him. These scriptures describe the way of Cain, but they speak evil of those things which they know not. So if they don't know, well, if I don't know, how am I supposed to be judged for? You know, that was, that was the case. That was the one. I told this story not that long ago, but... I forgot this part. 
you know, it was like I stand before God and, you know, and I said, Lord, I don't, I don't know this. I, I didn't know this. And that's why I did what I did and da, 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 da. I just, I didn't know it. And he said, you got a Bible, don't you? You got a heart, don't you? You can, you can pursue him without your thoughts and your plans and your web and all of that and just get, just, just press past your mind and let his mind be in you. And it, it tells you what his mind is. So, you know, I mean, so many people preach obedience. If obedience is it, we're all in trouble. Just flat out, we'll just do it. Well, this ain't Nike, folks. This is Christ. It ain't Nike. <clears throat> um, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. But they do know something, and they proceed on that basis in relationship with the Lord naturally in those things they corrupt themselves they corrupt themselves well so and so did this I wouldn't be in this place if my parents hadn't put me in an orphanage when I was young when I was 11 God was there in the orphanage <laughs> hallelujah he was there. I didn't get born again for years later, but he showed up several times. And only after I got saved, I looked back and went, oh, my God. <clears throat> In those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. They have gone the way of Cain. Woe unto them. They corrupt themselves. Now, okay. None of us. None of us think that that includes us. We're not Cain. We're always the good one. We're not Ishmael. We're Isaac. No, Jesus is all of these things. <laughs> He's the firstborn. We say, well, I got Jesus. Well, let his firstborn son go to the Father then. Let him come out of you and go to sacrifice unto the Father and give himself. They corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. Woe unto them. For they have gone the way of Cain. <clears throat> All right. So, but to speak evil reveals a deeper problem. The problem is the innate issues of, the, of his heart, of Cain's heart. Innate issues, innate issues. They are innate within you. They are what you are. They are, they are the fiber of your being. They are not your actions. Um, even your thoughts come from those things uh, based on all the unfair, unfair things that you've gone through or all the things that you don't, don't like, or all the jealousies, or all the, in fact, I, where is that? Okay, the, the problem is the innate issues of his heart, his mental processes, including jealousy and pride. <clears throat> so let us examine the basis for what caused Cain to hate and then kill his own brother. To begin with, we must notice that he could not endure. This is really important right here. To begin with, we must notice, and, and before I read it, I'm telling you this is the same all the way through on all of the stories, okay? To begin with, we must notice that he could not endure the special favor and honor that Abel received from God over his offering. He just couldn't stand that he was... Abel was being recognized as the firstborn, and he wasn't because, well, that's my right, saith Esau. Saith every firstborn that's not a firstborn, meaning Christ being the firstborn in them. They're firstborn by birth, but they have missed the boat. 
If you recall, we saw the same reaction arise with the elder son toward the prodigal in the prodigal son story. So he gets all upset, and he gets upset with the father, and he gets upset with the prodigal, and he gets upset with the situation. He doesn't like how this is going, okay? He has been given by God a perfect opportunity to break with the way of Cain or the way of the firstborn that is not a firstborn. To break with it. And instead, Father, come out to my way of thinking. Come out to my fears. Come out to my stuff. Come to me. Come, you know, so I can yell at you and accuse you. I just need to get this out, okay? I just need to. So come on out, Father. I just need, I just need a release. I'm sure I'll be perfect after this. Right? Isn't it, isn't it true that if we all just yell and scream or go get drunk or do something wild or whatever, m hurt somebody or whatever, that after we get it out, everything's going to be okay, right? No. We're exactly the same. The fire is still burning under our teapot. We just let some of the steam off. And somebody got burned. fire still burning in us. I know about that fire. I know about it. I know all about it. And I know what puts it out too. We also saw it in the parable of the vineyard. And though the elder son of that story did not go so far as to kill the prodigal son, yet the internal issues within were the same as with Cain. All right, so the elder son in the prodigal son story can say, because this is New Testament, right? He can look back and he can say, well, at least I didn't kill my brother. So is he all right then? No. It's the same thing. Whether you fully manifest that thing is not the issue, although I have told you time and time again, you better watch your manifestations. Speaking evil, uh, doing things to make someone look bad, saying things to make someone look bad, um, getting, gathering people onto your side against somebody. Uh, all of that is evil speaking. Speaking of evil, it's evil speaking. <clears throat> Matthew quotes Jesus saying, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Okay, so the loophole that the elder son uh, will use to justify himself is that phrase, angry without a cause. Well, I'm, I got a cause. Yeah, you have an elder son cause, not a Jesus lamb cause. Can I get an amen on this? My God, amen. this is important. We can't justify, we can't take the word of Jesus and twist it to, to, to keep alive something that needs to be crucified and gone out of our lives. Lord, help us. There's no way that you will, what, let's see, the loophole that any elder son will use to justify himself is that phrase, angry without a cause. There's no way that you will ever be able to convince an elder son mentality that it does not have every right to be angry because of how they view the inequitableness and injustice of the situation. Unfair. Unfair. It's unfair. This is unfair. That's my just cause. I have just cause. This is unfair. I sound like the good doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't trying to. <laughs> Maybe I should have been an actor. <clears throat> you know I'm joking. But it is unfair that I'm not. 
Just kidding. <clears throat> um, the elder son in Luke 15 had lost his place as firstborn son along with its blessings, even as with Cain. The sense of entitlement was the issue because all is viewed as what? Unfair. That sense of entitlement. Okay. If you have a sense of entitlement, when things don't go your way, you are going to label it unfair. You may not use un the word unfair. You may use the word it's not fair. <clears throat> this is what explains God's warning to Cain in verse 6 and 7. Okay, so here it is. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, or angry? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. All right, so... That phrase, uh, sin lieth at the door, um, it is better translated, sin crouches at the door. These things are in Cain like a brute beast that is crouching at the door of his manifestation. But they have not yet pounced when God's saying that. So, because this, I, I just quoted the, the first conversation between Cain and God just then verse 7 and 8 I think it is <clears throat> um, that's before he's killed it so God is saying to him <clears throat> you know if sin is crouching at the door in fact let me just see where I left off here so God explains to Cain and to all who are like and of him that all does not have to end in destruction just because the beast in you is crouched at the door. He can remain in a state of some degree of poise as long as he restrains his desire to retaliate, including not reach his hand or mouth to destroy the brother whom he is jealous over, nor seek to set himself up above his younger brother in any manner. Because I labeled those, I put those down because those seem to be some of the major things that are over and over in these stories that I'm, we've talked about and will talk about. Same thing, they're the same thing. Cain lives but not unto God. But this is difficult to do for these things are the way of an elder brother, of, a, of elder brothers, of all elder brothers who are out from Cain's mentality and viewpoint, Jude 10 and 11. It is the mode and it is the manner and mythology of that particular seed. This is unfortunate because the main attitude of God's firstborn son and what he once worked into every potential firstborn is lowliness of heart resulting in willingness to appear to become less in the eyes of others. Do you, do you see? <clears throat> Basically what I just read is <clears throat> This is a hard thing to try to explain to an elder son because he only knows the way of, of what's naturally as brute beast. The beast crouches at the door. He only knows that. It comes natural. The beast has been trained to, to, to pounce. has been trained. And you do that over a lifetime. You know, Cain doesn't sound like he was like seven years old and Abel was six. You know what I mean? This is, the, we develop these things, folks. We develop these things. Uh, we corrupt ourselves. That's what it says in Jude. We are corrupting ourselves with these things and allowing it. And well, if anybody, um, you know, crosses me or whatever, they'll pay the price. You know, 
well, what do you mean by that? I got a beast and, and he's ready to pounce, sucker. He'll eat your lunch. All right. Um, and so what I'm talking about is, you know, how difficult that is because you can't, you have to explain something that they know not, which is the life that was put in you is a lamb, a slaughtered lamb. You ate a dead lamb, a slaughtered lamb. That's what you put in you. You didn't just eat a sacrifice. You ate the sacrificial one. And you put it in you, and God expects that. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that grows until it fills everything. <clears throat> That's the good, the one good use of leaven in the scripture. <clears throat> well, you take that which is small, a little leaven. You, that can destroy everything. A little of that spirit. And what will it do when it's, when it's leaven that puffs itself up? It will become entitled. And it will see everything in light of what is deserved to them and what others are getting what belongs to them. Now, that's why they killed Jesus. And that's why they, Joseph, the brothers killed Joseph. And that's why Esau wanted to kill his brother. And that's why Cain did kill his brother. It's all exactly the same. I don't care how you slice it. It's exactly the same. It's, can I say it like this? It's always going to be the truth. <clears throat> so, what if you had a lamb that was laid at the door? And somebody did you wrong. Come on, little lamb. Come on. Let's get up. Let's go out. Let's go greet them. The beast said, I ain't greeting them. I don't even want to be around them. And then I said, it's sad that you can't reach them because, I, I wrote, this is unfortunate because the main attribute of God's firstborn son, the main attribute of the l slaughtered lamb on the throne that everybody's worshiping. Again, I repeat, <clears throat> Jesus didn't die so he'd be resurrected. He died to the glory of the Father. And the Father exalted that which died to the throne. And he's still seen as a slaughtered lamb. And that's what we're supposed to worship. Not a resurrected, powerful, I'm almighty Oz and everybody bow down to me. I'm sorry. It's not. What was he before the foundation of the world? A lamb slain. Was there sin? No. Why was he slain? Because that's his nature. That's describing our God from before there was a world, before there was Satan, before there was sin, before there was anything else. And then in the, in the end, same thing, same one, same beautiful one. And, and, and the fullness of time, as it were, right in between the testaments, on a cross, slaughtered lamb. All we see is he died for our sin. This is unfortunate because the main attribute of God's firstborn son and what he once worked into every potential firstborn is lowliness of heart, resulting in willingness to appear or become less in the eyes of others. Remember that little phrase there. Willingness to become less, and what did I say? And... Uh, become less, a willingness to appear or become less in the eyes of others. Okay, remember that because we are going to have a feast. Not tonight, but we are going to have a feast. 
God will bring forth circumstances to test what we are made of. Do y'all believe that? Oh, man. I thought those were just bad things happening. I just thought they were trials. I just thought my husband or my wife was just, you know, being, in, being snotty today or critical. You know, I just thought my boss was just, you know. Uh, you know, I'm jumping ahead here, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. Abraham, every time God would appear to him and tell him of the great blessings that were coming, immediately it would go bad. Every time. So God says, God finally appears to him and says, uh, I, I give you the whole land. Walk through it and everything. And then what happens? A famine comes and he go, ends up down in Egypt. What am I doing now? I thought I was possessing the land. You're not open, you know. You just say stuff and you don't back it up. Yeah, I'm testing you, <laughs> knucklehead. I'm testing you. You know, well, you know, it doesn't look, it doesn't feel like. If we could just, you know, crawl up into the bosom of the father and find his son in the heart of the father, we would let that we would let the Holy Spirit breathe that into us. And we would not be worried about this and that. And we would just go, oh, this is, and this, and you know, this blessing is a blessing, but so is this, yes. you know? Light and darkness are the same to him. And they really are, and some of us know, I mean, I, I, you know, I know that. But do we know it enough? I don't, you know, it's not, it is never good enough to know the scripture on it. <laughs> Unless you're, you know, rebuking the devil. <laughs> you know. What's that, that old saying? It's, it's a, you should give everything you got every such a way, situation unless you're giving blood. <laughs> the Spirit of God, can you, can you see this descent on Jesus when we're, we're, we got out of our little, our little chair, our little desk, classroom mentality, and we came in and we sat down and we went behind the veil. We just went on in because he told us we could. And we just saw him sitting there. And as it were, he just crawled up there in the father's lap and leaned over to know his heart for Jesus and to know who Jesus really is. And the dove, all of a sudden he appears and he comes in. He just gently lands, and he says, you're in the right place. This is the holy of holies. It doesn't get any more holy than this. Lord, Lord. So I need to finish this paragraph, and then we're done. I will reread that one sentence and then finish the next two, I think it is. Um, this is unfortunate because the main attribute of God's firstborn son and what he wants worked into every potential firstborn is lowliness of heart, resulting in willingness to appear or become less in the eyes of others. God will bring forth circumstances to test what we are made of. The application of the cross humbles 
and lowers us whereby abasement comes. But like Cain, instead of yielding to his lamb nature, we resent what is happening to us. Now that's unfortunate. It's worse than unfortunate, but it's certainly that. I'd love to, but I just left left it. Yes, I'll read it one more time. <clears throat> well, I'll just read the whole paragraph one more time. But this is difficult to do, for these things are the way. They're the way of all elder brothers who are out from Cain's mentality and viewpoint, Jude 10 and 11. It is the mode, manner, and methodology of that particular seed. That being settled in our being, then we say this is unfortunate because the main attribute of God's firstborn son and what he wants worked into every potential firstborn is lowliness of heart, resulting in willingness to appear or become less in the eyes of others. God will bring forth circumstances to test what we are made of. The application of the cross humbles and lowers us, whereby abasement comes. But, like Cain, instead of yielding to his lamb nature, we resent what is happening to us. Father, we just love you and we love the son of your heart. Mm, the scripture it's translated the son of your love. Oh, how, how, how much he is the son of the father's heart, your heart, father. The son of the father's heart. Never to change, never was different in eternity before, never will be different in eternity past. Thank you for the dove. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who any time the heart turns to the Lord, he will come and reveal him. He will come and reveal him in such a manner that we are changed into that same image to the glory of God the Father, to the glory of the Father, to the great glory of the Father. And so we are, we are not purveyors of changing ourselves. We are they who seek your heart, Father, and the heart of the Son and the heart of the Spirit as to what is in his heart to do and to be to us. And so we are we are humbled by the things that we hear and yet like that thief on the cross we, we turn we turn to the crucified Jesus we turn to him and when we speak we don't speak of ourselves unless it's in negative terms we, we speak of him and he removes our negative terms and makes us one and we are one, and we are one. And that was your heart, that's what you bled for, that's what you cried for in Gethsemane, that's what you wanted so much from before eternity or before time started. And you came and you gave yourself to that end. Wife of the Lamb. Thank you. Thank you, precious Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And as I was praying, the Lord reminded me of something that he shared with me even recently, and that was the Trinity, the Trinity. We, we, if someone said, do you love the Trinity, we'd say, we would divide it up, and we'd say, I love the Father, I love the Son, I love the Holy Spirit. We wouldn't really love the Trinity. We would love the three people that we call the Trinity. 
But do you love the Trinity? That's that nature that protects and loves and gives to their own heart for the other and does not declare themselves, but declares the other. Do you love the Trinity? That's, that's the love of the Trinity. Amen. Amen.